Romans chapter 1, we hit verses 1 through 6, how that Paul is a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. We talked about in verse 3 how Jesus Christ is the subject of the book of Romans, how that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and we looked at his genealogy a little bit, and how he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. We looked at his resurrection, we looked at the different spirits in the New Testament. Verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. We looked at those a little bit. For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Verse 6, among whom, so among those nations, are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. And we looked at the verse in Romans 8 that talks about how you and I are the called. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we saw that God's calling is not something that he just chooses at random. It's based on the fact that he foreknew that you would believe on him. And so before the foundation of the world in Christ, he called you and he predestinated you. He called you, he justified you and he glorified you. And some of those things haven't happened yet in time, but they happened in Christ outside of time. And uh, it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, but some things are in the Bible. Eternity is a hard thing for a temporal person to understand. Let's look at verse 7. Verse 7 is where we're going to start in <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. It says, here's who he's writing to. So, normally in a letter you start out right here, you know, dear, we're going to say, uh, Jimmy. And then you write, you know, Concerning, and in this letter it's Jesus Christ, but if I'm writing a letter to Jimmy, it's probably, hey, concerning that trailer you borrowed from me, uh, okay. and then there at the end it's going to say something like, love, you know, Daniel. And brother, I'll just be honest with you, I'm probably not going to put love in the uh, like, yeah, I'm probably going to say love in Christ. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Daniel. So in a letter you've got who it's written to, who it's written from, and what it's about. In this letter so far, we've already got who wrote it. At the beginning, it's Paul. And then in verse 3, it's concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here in verse 7, we've got who he's writing to. To all that be in Rome. Good. And Rome, if you don't know, on the map, you've got Israel over here. And once again, I'm no good at drawing anything, but uh, oh, down here you've got... You know, the Sinai Peninsula down here, and Israel's over here. And this right here is the Mediterranean Sea, and I don't know exactly how it's shaped. I know Greece is somewhere around here. And over here, you've got this uh, thing that kind of looks like a boot. This uh, country, and you've got, you know, Spain down here, and you've got France up here. And right here is a country called Italy, which is mentioned in the Bible. And the capital of Italy is what? Rome. 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 So Paul is writing from, um, I think, Corinth. It's at the very end of your book of Romans there. It says, written to the Romans from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria. So Paul is writing from Corinth, which is somewhere over here, closer to Greece, and he's writing to Rome. And who does he write to in Rome? Just a couple of the Christians? All that be where? In Rome. In Rome. Rome. Good. Beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, a couple things about Rome. First off, Paul had never been there. At this point, Paul had not made it to Rome. Right? He was writing to a group of people he had never met yet. And at the end of his ministry, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, he decided he wanted to get to Jerusalem, right? And the Spirit of God warned him three times not to go, right? right. Did he go anyway? Yes. Yes. Paul ended up going to Jerusalem anyway in the book of Acts around chapters uh, 20, 21, and 22. And then the rest of the book of Acts is about how Paul is basically taken prisoner, and he's a prisoner until the day he dies. He's taken captive and taken up to Caesarea, and from Caesarea... After a long <laughs> battle with a ship, he's sailed and sailed, and they have shipwreck and all kinds of stuff. But where do you think he finally winds up? 
Rome. Paul finally winds up in Rome. And there's a verse I wanted you to see. So how many times did the Holy Spirit warn Paul not to go to Rome? Three. Three times. In Acts 23, 11, Jesus said something to him. He says, the night following, so after Paul has disobeyed God and he's gone to Jerusalem, and instead of doing the ministry to the Gentiles that God wanted him to, he's taken prisoner in Jerusalem. And did God want him to go to Jerusalem? No. No. But look at Acts 23, 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Sorry, you don't have to turn there. The Lord stood by him, Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So don't worry about it, Paul. I know you disobeyed. I know you weren't supposed to go here. But while you're in Jerusalem, you did testify of me. And... I know you've desired to go to Rome, so I'm going to let you, in my grace and in my mercy, I'm going to let you go to Rome because I have a job for you to do there, and that is to testify, to bear witness. So, obviously, Rome is on Paul's heart, and it's on his mind, and he writes this letter to the Christians at Rome. And I want to let you know that Rome was the world power at that time. They were in charge. Rome was the largest empire in the world. They dominated the most land. They had the most powerful emperors. Uh, think of people like Constantine, powerful. Julius Caesar, who was you know, uh, earlier than Constantine. Right at this time, I think the emperor is Nero. Uh, it says that in the note after 1st or 2nd Timothy. And this is the capital of the biggest nation in the world, the dominant absolute powerhouse that'd be like going to washington dc you know 30 years ago when america was the undisputed dominant world power uh it's a big deal this is the the seat of the biggest nation in the world and rome as a nation was founded around 500 bc so 500 years before christ it only lasted about a thousand years it fell about 500 a.d but on the timeline, if you look at a timeline of the history of the world, you know, let's go back here. We've got, take like uh, Solomon. He's around about 1000 BC. And then after him, you know, in uh, the, the kingdom of Babylon takes over, right? Uh, around uh, 600, you've got Babylon who conquers Israel and then scoot forward just another hundred years and they're not the world power yet but here around 500 Rome shows up and, and kind of forms as a nation and then by the time that Jesus is on the earth Rome is a real powerhouse in 500 years they've done a lot of conquering they've done a lot of taking over after Babylon another kingdom took over after them called Persia and they were coupled with another country called Media. So it's Media, Persia, or Persia and Media. After Persia and Media were the world power, the next world power was Greece. And after Greece, the next world power that took over was Rome. And in Daniel, back here around 600 BC, God specifically told Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, that this would happen. He gave it to him in a dream, and he didn't know the meaning, and so he sought for Daniel, and Daniel showed him the meaning. And the meaning taught him this. You remember the statue? It was a head, and the head was made of what? It starts with a G. Gold. It ends in an old. Yeah, gold. The breast was, and the arms were of Iron. silver. silver. Good. Iron. The belly and the thighs were of brass. And the legs were of iron. iron, and it says the feet were part iron mixed with clay, part clay. Now, the gold head was Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. God was telling him, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, I know you're in charge right now, but not long after you, you powerful gold head, another kingdom is going to take over. The kingdom of the Medes and the Persians is going to be split into two different kingdoms, like you got two different arms. So the Media Persian Empire comes up after Babylon and takes over. And God 
told Nebuchadnezzar that it would happen before it ever happened. And after that, who takes over the Medo-Persian Empire? Greece. Alexander the Great conquers, does, dominates the world. In Babylon, we have Nebuchadnezzar. In Media Persia, we have kings like Darius, Cyrus, who is Artaxerxes, or uh, one of those is Artaxerxes. Uh, those names that we have in the Bible and that appear in world history as well outside of the Bible. We have Alexander the Great is the leader of the Greece, uh, the Grecian army that dominates most of the world. It pushes all the way east towards India. It pushes down into Egypt. He conquered a massive amount of the world. Alexander the Great. And then after Greece, the world power becomes Rome. Rome takes over and although they're different kingdoms, they serve the same master. All these kingdoms serve the devil. Since the very beginning, when Nimrod founded Babel, this religion of worshiping the devil got started. And when you worship the devil, and you worship him really good, usually he'll reward you with power. And that's what happened, I believe, with Nimrod and, and how the Babylonian religion got started. And if you look, uh, we've talked about the book The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop before. The Roman religion, by the way, it's not just a country, it's a religion. Roman Catholicism is exactly the same as Babylonian devil and Baal worship was. Very similar. Of, of all those old gods that they worshipped back then are still being worshipped down at the San Juan Diego mission on the corner of the crossroads over there. It's <coughs> the same old thing. And the reason I wanted to show you this prophecy from Daniel is that, yeah, he was at like 600 BC and then the Persians were after them, the Greeks were after them, and Rome was only in power for about a thousand years back in the day, but when Rome fell, and here's what I wanted to get to here, when Rome fell around 500 AD, who became the world power? If you know your world history. From about 500 to 1500, for the next thousand years, it was what people call the Dark Ages, where people quit learning how to read and write. Uh, that's where you think of like knights and the Crusades Europe. and the Black Plague in Europe. What European nation was dominant from 500 to 1500. Anybody know? There's no one nation that really dominated the whole time. You know who dominated behind the scenes? Here's what they call themselves. Who knows what that stands for? Holy Roman Empire. The Holy, which is a bad word to use. They're not holy. The Holy Roman Empire. You know who was in control of Europe for the entire Middle Ages? One guy, his name was the Pope. He kept changing seats, but the Pope was the dominant power. The Catholic Church of who? Of what country? Rome. Rome. The Romans were in control until 500 AD physically and spiritually. They continued to be in control until today. And the Roman Catholic Church is the Roman kingdom spiritually controlling the world still to this day. I probably could have taught that in a way that was a little less confusing, but even to this day, I wanted you to know, uh, what's the longest part of my body looking at me? My legs, right? The Roman kingdom lasted the longest. These kingdoms all just lasted a little bit. The head didn't last that long. The arms and the belly, they lasted okay, but not too long. Greece didn't last that long. The longest part, God called the iron kingdom. And if you remember from our study of Cain, iron is connected with devils. The devilish kingdom, Rome, is the longest lasting kingdom. They lasted for about a thousand years physically, and then spiritually, they still last to this day. By the way, when the Dark Ages ended, and do you know what ended the Dark Ages? The world will teach you that the Renaissance ended the Dark Ages, where man became enlightened and they learned about art and science and music, and it was beautiful. What really brought us out of the Dark Ages is not the Renaissance, it was the Reformation. Men like Martin Luther, uh, plenty of others, Huss, and, and, and a ton of men that you can read about in church history, decided that they would preach the truth instead of the Catholic doctrine. Men like Martin Luther, we were just talking about today, he was a Catholic priest. But God taught him using the Bible, using verses in Romans chapter 1. He saw Romans 1. 17 and at the end of Romans 1 17 it says the just shall live by faith and when Martin Luther saw that he realized 
That's not what we're teaching and preaching here in the Catholic Church. We're teaching and preaching penance, and that you have to pay some priest to have your sins forgiven, and that you go to purgatory and other things. And no, Martin Luther wasn't perfect, but what he did realize was that salvation is by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ, and he repented of his bad teaching as a priest, and he started preaching the truth. That was around 1500. I'm trying to remember the exact year that he posted his 95 thesis on the wall of the monastery there, or the, the church there, but um, men like that preaching the truth from the Bible is what started bringing the world back to light out of the Dark Ages after 1500. And what happens 100 years later, around 1611? God gives a perfect King James Bible. What country was in control all through the Middle Ages? Not really any of them. But God uses seven different versions of the English Bible. He purifies it seven times. And as a result of following and believing the King James Bible and because of God's plan, England becomes the dominant, no doubt about it, powerhouse in the world. And we were just talking about it today. England gets in control of tons of countries in Africa. They control India, one of the highest populations in the world. They start to colonize America. They colonize a little bit in South America. They are dominating the world. They dominate trade. Every nation in the world today still uses the English language because of the dominance that England had around 1500 to you know 1700 AD. God set up the English nation so that he could get his word all throughout the world. And uh, what stayed alive behind the scenes that whole time? Creepy old dirty Rome and uh, the devil's kingdom, the Roman Catholic Church, stayed alive behind the scenes. England's dominance came as a direct result of their rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church. Um, you should read and study English history. It's very, very important. It's where most of you and I came from, uh, and at least Europe. And uh, it's important to understand where we came from and how these things came about. It's awesome to see what the Lord has done in history. So, Daniel, why are you talking about all this? Because in Romans chapter 1 and verse 8 or 7, it says, To all that be in Rome, and I taught you all this to tell you this. I don't think that Rome in this verse is just talking about that city that existed back in Paul's day. I believe it is still talking about you and me because we are still under a Roman-controlled world. You say, I'm not a Roman. I'm an American. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Our Supreme Court, we've mentioned this, our Supreme Court has how many members in it? Nine. Guess how many members of our Supreme Court are Roman Catholics? Six. Six of the nine members of our Supreme Court are Roman Catholic. If you make that a decimal, what do you think it is? Two thirds. Six repeating. <laughs> I stopped at three for convenience. <laughs> Two thirds of our Supreme Court is Roman Catholic. If you look at heads of companies all around the world, obviously the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church has a massive, massive authority. And every single good Roman Catholic, at the end of the day, who do you think they answer to? The Pope. Any Roman Catholic, if you call yourself a Roman Catholic and you're in the Supreme Court, at the end of the day, your final authority is not the Bible, your final authority is not the Constitution. If you're a good Roman Catholic, at the end of the day, your final authority that you're going to answer to is the Pope. He is your authority. So the Pope has a massive sway. The Catholic Church, which is the devil's religion, has a massive influence on the world that we live in. And spiritually, we still are surrounded by a Roman government. One third of our current House of Representatives is Catholic. One third of the House, or one third of the Senate is Catholic. Our President of the United States, guess what religion he is? Yeah. Roman Catholic. He's the second Roman Catholic president, by the way. One out of six people on the planet claim to be Catholic. And the great whore of Revelation, the Antichrist's government system, is Roman Catholicism. Let me ask you this. Do you think the devil knows exactly what day the tribulation will start? No. No, I don't believe so either. I don't know the day. I don't think you do either. The devil, I don't believe, knows the day or the time that it will start. But I can tell you this. Ever since Jesus Christ died on the cross, the devil set up a religion in Catholicism. He claimed Peter as his first pope. He stole that guy. And, and since Jesus Christ died, the devil has had a religion ready in place, ready to go, 
if the Lord caught the church out and the Antichrist needed to begin his work. And, you know, it's very clear to see when you study world history that the devil has had that Roman Catholic church in charge basically since the time of Christ. Um, and God prophesied that that would happen with these iron legs right here. And the iron legs are talking about Rome spiritually, or, uh, physically and spiritually now. And the feet, part iron, part clay, are talking about those half devil, half men, people that we're going to be dealing with, that the world will be dealing with in the tribulation. The feet are talking about the tribulation. And uh, you know there are ten kings in the tribulation that are represented by the ten toes on the feet. Iron and clay representing how that, just like Genesis 6, devils and men will breed together once again, like it says in the book of Daniel. And God is not surprised by any of this. So just because we're still under a Roman government does not mean that you need to fear. It doesn't need, mean that you need to worry about it. Just be aware of the fact that the world that you live in is controlled by the devil. He's the god of this world. And the religion that he has put in place to control most people on the planet is Roman Catholicism. And it's not something that you need to respect or talk nice about. It is the devil's religion. It is evil. It is the great whore. <laughs> that is what God calls it. It is evil. It is wicked. And uh, you and I are under that kingdom. <clears throat> That's where we live, a Roman-controlled world. So when it says to all that be in Rome, it's talking about people who are under a Roman government. That's you and me, just like these people were back when <coughs> Paul was writing this. It's to a group of people that Paul had never met before. That's you and me. It was to Gentiles. That's you and me. The book of Romans applies to all Gentile Christians throughout the whole world since Paul wrote it. The book of Romans is the great foundational book of Paul's doctrine. It's so important to understand. To all that be in Rome. Notice, by the way, in this entire letter to the Romans, Peter is not mentioned one time. Who is the first pope, according to the Catholics? Yeah. Peter. They take Peter as their first pope, because Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so they say that God founded the church upon Peter. Well, that's not what he did. He founded the church upon Jesus Christ. And Peter never went to Rome, I don't believe. And they say that they've got his bones and his you know, grave there in uh, Rome, and they do not. <laughs> uh, and Paul didn't mention Peter one time in his letter to the Romans. I would imagine if God had set Peter up to be the first pope, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, probably would have said something like, oh yeah, and pay attention to Peter, your first pope. No, he, he forgot to, to mention that uh, little detail. So he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, what's that next part say? Called, called to, be to be saints. saints. Good. Beloved of God, called to be saints. Now, when it says beloved of God, he doesn't capitalize the B there. Beloved of God. Who is he talking to? A few of the Christians? All. all. To all that be in Rome. So all Christians, that's you and me, are beloved of God. Thank the Lord for that. That's a blessing. At one point, you and I were God's enemies. Enemies because we were unbelievers. We hated his son. We hated God. And when we trusted in him, we became beloved of God because he put us into his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, he calls us accepted in the beloved. Being a saint is a very sweet and special privilege that God gives to those who trust in him. And there are two people in the Bible who stand out to me as beloved of God. And being beloved of God comes with some benefits. Uh, two people that stand out to me, Daniel and John. If you look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, and 10, 11. Daniel 9, 23, and 10, 11. You and I are called beloved of God, which is a great, great blessing. I would much rather be beloved of God than to be his enemy. Daniel 9, 23. This is the prophecy of the 70 weeks, and an angel named Gabriel shows up to Daniel, and he's talking to him, and he says, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, 
And I am come to show thee. This is Gabriel, the angel, talking to Daniel. He says, For thou art greatly beloved. And in chapter 10, verse 11, he says, And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee. He's greatly beloved, and because he's greatly beloved, beloved of God, God wants him to understand the words that he speaks unto him. Over on in John 10, 19, just a couple verses down. And said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. So Daniel is greatly beloved, and in the Old Testament, there's no man who got quite as clear revelation of the future as Daniel. Daniel got some of the most specific and vivid prophecies of anybody in the whole Bible. Daniel got the picture that lays out to us how world history would unfold from the time of Daniel in Babylon all the way till the tribulation. He got the whole picture. He got other pictures. Well, that's in Daniel, I believe, chapter 2. He got pictures in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. In chapters 10, 11, and 12, he gets details on the tribulation and times before the tribulation of how world wars would go, of how the wars in the tribulation would go. At the end of the book of Daniel, in chapter 12, God tells Daniel, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then in Revelation 22.10, God says to John, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. God gave Daniel the most clear tribulational prophecy that you could imagine of world history and then the tribulation and says, Seal up the book. And then in Revelation, God gives John the Bible's most clear and clearly laid out account of the tribulation and then says, don't seal the book. The time is at hand. So there's two men, Daniel and John. And Daniel is called beloved of God. He's beloved. John is called the apostle whom Jesus loved. And both of them are given very clear revelation of prophecy. So when you are beloved of God, I believe it comes alongside of being beloved of God comes a understanding of prophecy an understanding of God's words and because we are beloved of God he gave us his Holy Spirit to give us understanding of his words the Jews not so much today but the Jews at least in the time of Christ and uh, after Daniel was dead looked up to Daniel and God even mentioned Daniel as one of the three greats in the Old Testament and they knew that he had been given abundant wisdom he had an excellent spirit in him, and they knew that God had revealed a bunch to Daniel. And I'm sure a lot of them wished they could be like Daniel and know as much as Daniel knew. I'm sure people after the book of Revelation would wish, man, I wish I could have been John. I wish the Holy Spirit would catch me up and show me the things I see back there. And you know what? Because you're beloved of God, he wants to give you the same kind of understanding. He gave you the whole book of Daniel and the whole book of Revelation, and he put the Holy Spirit in you to teach you those things. And he gave you 64 other books to cross-reference with those things so you could have a full understanding of the full counsel of God, so you could know the truth, so the truth could make you free. When you're beloved of God, you get this amazing benefit of understanding the truth. And that's what Daniel got, that's what John got. Specifically, like it says in Revelation 19, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. God loves prophecy. Uh, God already is in the future. Clarence Larkin says one of my favorite quotes, prophecy is just history written in advance. God said it's going to happen, so it's going to happen. And studying prophecy uh, is not only a major part of being a Christian, it's a major part of the Bible. Most of the Bible is about future events. And uh, if it's not specifically talking about future events, then it's a story about somebody who's being a picture of future events. The whole Bible is prophetic. And uh, I didn't say pathetic. I said prophetic. And uh, you and I are pathetic. <laughs> but even though we're pathetic, thank God we're beloved of God. And so was Daniel, and so was John. And you can see those verses in John 13, 23. In John 19, 26. And there are a few others, but 
put those there just to show you that's where he calls him the beloved John 13 23 is where he says now there was leaning on Jesus bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved and then in 1926 he says when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved he saith unto his mother woman behold thy son so when you're beloved of God he gives you a special understanding a special gift of being able to understand his words and thank the Lord you and I are all beloved of God it's a massive blessing and we shouldn't take it for granted that he gives us understanding of his words and that we're beloved how many people are out there who aren't loved by anybody there's a lot of folks who are orphaned who don't have any father who don't have any mother who don't have any children just lost and lonely in the world but if they trust in Jesus Christ they're more loved than anybody has ever been Amen. but if being beloved of God is not reserved to a select few it is to anybody who believes on Jesus Christ to right. all that be in Rome beloved of God and remember if God loves somebody you should too and uh, that doesn't mean you all treat everybody exactly the same. There are different rules for how to treat different people. Like if somebody is doing right, and if they are trying to walk with the Lord, and they come into church, and they're just weeping and having a hard time, you're supposed to weep with them that weep. But if somebody is living in open fornication as a Christian, and they're proud about it, and they're not repenting of it, and they come into the church, they should be rebuked and not allowed to hang around. There's different treatment. Even though you love them, you treat them different, just like God does. He chastises and chastens those who need it. Be beloved of God, love those who are beloved of God. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, the next phrase, called to be what? Saints. Saints. Once again, the Catholic Church teaches that saints are these like select few people who have earned the title of saint by doing great deeds and, and marvelous lifestyles and have served the Lord with a great ministry or whatever you know they select saint bartholomew and saint uh nicholas and saint patrick and saint what's her name Ther teresa mother teresa the great saint you know no a saint is somebody who is trusted in jesus christ to all that be in rome called to be saints there is not one christian who is not called to be a saint doesn't mean you're always going to act like one but you are called a saint if you are a Christian. And if you look all throughout the Bible, I'll let you do it if you want to, but you can take out your e-sword or your concordance, whatever you use to word search in the Bible. If you look up the word saint, what you will always find is that a saint is a person who is on God's side. It's the people of God are always called saints. In the Old Testament, if they were people following the Lord, keeping the law, doing right, they were called saints. In the New Testament, saints are those who have trusted in Jesus Christ uh, who have believed on him and are in his son. That's who the saints are. In every one of his 13 church epistles, Paul starts his message with grace and peace. And right here he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it say right there? God our Father and who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what the Bible says? Yes. The Lord Jesus Christ. I, we even saw a bumper sticker today. I don't know if everybody else noticed it. It said this. Christ the Lord. You know, which sounds sweet. This is something that uh, Dr. Ockman pointed out that I haven't seen uh, anywhere else is that the world likes to say Christ is Lord. And it's easy to call anything a Lord. Christ is a Lord. The Bible says Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ, not Christ is Lord. And there are things that we pointed out like last week. A lot of people like to say this one. This is a current popular phrase in Christianity that Christ is King. And you say, Daniel, what's wrong with that? Why can't we call Christ King? Well, we looked at it last time. Jesus Christ is not the King of anything right now according to the Bible right now he is a prince he is the prince of peace right now he is the prince under God who is the king and in the book of Revelation at the beginning he's the prince but then at the end he becomes the king of kings when he comes down and takes the throne 
Until then, he's not king. And that's a reason, that's a Bible reason not to call him king. Here's another good Bible reason not to say this. Find me one place in the Bible where it says Christ is king. Where Paul mentions Christ is our king. He's the king. No. Say, what's wrong with thinking of Christ as our king? There's nothing wrong with thinking of Jesus Christ as the one in charge of you. He is our Lord. Obviously, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. We know he's in charge. But you don't need to be going using worldly phrases that you cannot find in the Bible. You say, that sounds spiritual, Daniel. How could it be bad? When you change God's words and use words that you can't find in the Bible, phrases that you can't find in the Bible, you are on dangerous territory, just like Eve was. What did Eve do wrong? She took out God's words, she changed his words, she added to his words. It sounded awful close. It sounded good. Have you ever read the Book of Mormon? I have. It sounds like the King James Bible. If you didn't know any better, you would think you were reading the King James Bible. It sounds awful close. But it's not the King James Bible. You say, how can you tell? Well, the words are totally different and they don't agree one bit. But it sounds like it. It sounds really close. And when you read it, you kind of start to think, okay, well, I understand why so many people are deceived by this junk. Because it sounds really good. Christ is King sounds good. But it's not a Bible truth, and it's not words that you can find in the Bible. Same with Christ is Lord. You say, Daniel, what could be wrong with that? Well, we showed last time, saying Christ is king is satanic. It's putting Christ on a throne that he doesn't belong on right now. It's trying to do what the devil did to Jesus in Matthew 4 when he tempted him, is give him authority over that throne, over this world, before it was his. Trying to make Jesus step out of the Father's timeline, trying to make him do something out of turn, and it's not his turn. That's not calling Jesus Christ anything less than what he is. In 1 Corinthians 11, God, Christ, man, woman, that's the order God has it in right now. It's not putting Jesus Christ down at all. It's actually avoiding saying bad words. Good words and fair speeches which deceive the hearts of the simple. Christ light. What'd you say? Christ light. Christ light? What's that? Well, I mean, I heard that that's one. a common, common thing. Go right there in that list. Christ is Lord and, and we're going to be Christ light. That's, Christ light. Yeah. Oh, Christ like. Christ like. Yeah. Okay, I thought you were saying light. No, like. Like. Yeah, There's is, another one. He is, he is light. Yeah, but I'm talking about like. Yeah. Add it. Yes. <laughs> Add it to the list. Get your one. Got your one. That's a twofer. <laughs> this is another phrase right here. You'll hear it all the time when you turn on the radio and listen to preachers when you read a book about christianity they want to use this phrase you should be christ-like show me that phrase in the bible nowhere in the bible does it say that you should be like jesus christ we are being made to conform to the image of his son and that's something god is doing to us but that is not something you and i are trying to do and when they say christ-like what they mean is you should go back to matthew mark luke and john you should look at how jesus acted during his lifetime in his ministry to the Jews and you should pretend to be like him when he was ministering to the Jews under a different gospel than Paul preached and that is not what you are commanded to do you are commanded to be a follower this is a command to be an imitator which is the NIV ESV ASV that is the satanic word that God wants you to that the devil wants you to follow God wants you to be a follower of Jesus Christ and we talked about this before how that a good dog should follow his master. A good dog does not imitate his master. If my dog wanted to be Daniel-like, then every time I took a step, he would take a step. And every time I take another step, he would take a step. And if I jumped, my dog would jump. That's not what I want. I want my dog to sit there quietly with his rump on the ground looking at me until I say go and he'll go. Until I say come and he'll come. I don't want him to copy what I'm doing. That's imitating. I want him to do what I tell him to do. That is being a follower. And you and I should not try to mimic God and act the way he acts. We should do what he says. And by the way, Christ's example to us is that he did every single thing the Father told him to do. To a T. He didn't miss on one word. And uh, that's the example we ought to follow of uh, obeying the Lord, not trying to act like him. Christ is Lord. It's not in the Bible. It's dangerous. You don't need to... And it's easy to, you know, Christ is Lord. Well, throw him up there with all the other lords in the world. So is, you know, Drake and Kanye West and Joe Biden and, you know, all these other people who we can put on a pedestal. Well, it's different when you say the Lord, that the one, the only one, the Lord Jesus Christ is what the Bible calls him. Look at verse 8. The Lord Jesus Christ. First, 
What does he do first? I thank my God. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. First thing Paul does, I thank my God. You know that in 1 Thessalonians 5 it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. In Ephesians chapter 5, this wasn't in my notes, but I believe the Lord's telling me to say it. It says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Listen. Here's this list. Fornication. I'm going to do abbreviations here. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness. Does that sound good? No. Filthiness? You think that's a good thing? Nope. No. No. Nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. He just listed off one, two, three, four, five, six things which are not convenient. He says, I don't want you to do these six things. What does he want you to do instead? Give thanks. But rather, so instead of doing all these wicked things, but rather giving of thanks. Thanksgiving is not something we do just once a year. Uh, <laughs> Thanksgiving is something that a Christian ought to do first, every day, all day. Thanking God Amen. is so, so important. In Ephesians 5, he says that that is the thing you should do instead of sin. But rather, instead of doing all these things, rather, we should give thanks. And you know, it says, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Okay, I'll thank God in all the good times. No, you thank God in the good times, in the okay times, in the bad times. You thank him for the broken leg. You thank him for the bill that you don't know how you're going to pay. You thank him for the flooded basement. You thank him for the termite infestation. You thank him. Even if you don't like it, you thank the Lord for the things that he does in your life. In everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. First of all, you should give thanks in everything. Second, why should you give thanks? Because it's the will of God. Third, when should you give thanks? All the time in everything. How will it help me? Because it'll help keep you from fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking and jesting, all the wicked things that your flesh wants to do. Giving of thanks will help you in your fight against sin. And if you live a thankful life, it's easier to walk in the light as he is in the light. <coughs> Back in Romans chapter 1, verse 8, he said, First, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. And he wants to thank God for a specific thing about them. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Never forget to give God thanks for everything. He thanked God first. Notice that if you look, you know, those famous... Um, those, those award shows, like the Oscars, the Grammys, the VMAs, all those famous award shows, they want to get up, ah, I'd like to thank so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and, and if you're lucky, they might thank God, but how many times does Jesus Christ get thanked and honored and praised at something like that? You know, I don't think he wants his name mentioned around that kind of garbage. But when you give thanks, you ought to thank God, and Paul says, through Jesus Christ. It's not just, oh, well, I thank God, I thank my lucky stars. What? What was that that song yeah. that we heard not too long ago? You know, I'm proud to be an American. And that's, it says, I thank my lucky stars. I don't have any lucky stars. <laughs> uh, my stars are pretty unlucky, I think. I have God, and that's the only person I care to thank. You know, thank people for the, the things that they do, good things. You gotta be thankful to in everything, but I don't thank lucky stars. I don't thank the devil. I don't thank... Baal or the Roman Catholic Church. I don't thank Muslim. What I thank, and what you ought to thank, is God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. For what? That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. In Romans 16 and verse 19, we talked about this last time, how that Paul was on a mission. His mission as an apostle was the obedience of faith among all nations, so that all nations would believe in Jesus Christ. And in Romans 16, 19, we saw that uh, Paul says about the Romans, 
For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. This right here is the testimony of the Roman church. When people heard about the Roman church, the Christians at Rome, what they heard about was your obedience. The fact that they obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ, that they trusted in him, and that they wanted to do right. Your obedience has come abroad. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul praises the Thessalonian church similarly. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8, you can write it down. He says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. So something you learn about churches, and by the way, if you want to learn about a church, you don't need to buy some book by any pastor alive today. If you want to learn about the church, go to the Bible and look what the Bible says about the church. And one of the first things mentioned here that Paul thanks God for about the church at Rome is that their obedience, uh, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. When he's speaking to the Thessalonians, he's talking about how that their obedience is spread abroad. Their faith is spread abroad. So... First of all, as a church, you ought to live obedient and faithful to Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, your testimony of obedience and faithfulness to Jesus Christ will spread abroad. You don't need to buy billboards and you don't need to make some advertising program to spread the word. Your obedience and faithfulness to Jesus Christ will do the job. And some people will hate you for it. Some people will love you for it. But at the end of the day, God is thanked when those... Uh, who are his saints are obedient to him and if you want to glorify the Lord start by obeying him in your daily life faith by the way is belief in the words of God um, Romans 10 17 the famous verse it says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God you can't have faith without the words of God you need God's words to have faith and that old saying well you have your faith and I have mine well, down there, they worship a different little bit away. They have a different faith than I have. Well, that's not true faith. And you can't just let somebody get away with, oh, well, it's good that you have your faith. You know, Talking to a Muslim, a lot of Christians today would say, well, it's good that you have some sort, of, some sort of faith. No, it's not. It's not good that you have faith in Allah or Muhammad. It's only good to have faith in Jesus Christ. And any other faith is not faith. Faith is trusting in God's words. And uh, that's the only thing you need to put your trust in. You, you don't need to try to comfort some lost person by telling them, oh, it's good that you have faith. No, it's only good if somebody has faith in Jesus Christ and in his words. And uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by the Quran or by meditation, the worldly way. You know, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When they talk about you at your funeral, what will be said Will it be said that you had faith in Jesus Christ? It's a good question. The Romans had a testimony. When the world talked about them, they talked about their faith in Jesus. When you are sitting in a casket, if we don't get translated out of here, if you are sitting in a casket and some preacher, maybe it's going to be Pastor Jason, maybe it's going to be some guy down the street, I don't know. When somebody gets up and uh, testimonies are given at your funeral, what are they going to talk about? Oh, boy, could he fish. Oh, boy, was he a nice guy. Oh, boy, did he have a good car collection. Did he have a lot of property? He was, I mean, he would do anything for anybody. Yeah, that's all great. At the end of the day, at my funeral, I want them to talk about the fact that he had faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And here's a good test. If people aren't talking about that about you right now, they probably won't at your funeral. If you're not living faithful right now, what makes you think people will think you're faithful when you're dead? What are they going to think about you? You and I have been to a lot of funerals where the pastor's up there saying he was such a good boy, and you're sitting there thinking, <laughs> You want to go look and see if it's the same one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. Are you faithful? Are you faithful? Paul was thanking God for the faith that these Romans had. Look at verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So he said, for God is my witness, 
You've heard that phrase a thousand times. God is my witness. And he's claiming this right here as a proof. He's, if he was standing trial, he's pulling God up as his witness, as if the lawyer would ask God, God, does Paul really pray for these people? He's saying that he prays for these people. He's saying that he thanks you for uh, their faithfulness. Is it true? He's saying, God is my witness. This is a good truth right here that in your prayer life, maybe you get down on your knees and you could fake praying your whole life. Maybe you say a prayer one day or one time a day at the meal. I don't know how your prayer life is. But at the end of the day, only one person knows, really knows, besides you, how your prayer life is, and that's God. God is the only witness to the prayers that you whisper under your breath and to the prayers that you say in your heart and in your mind. And remember, when you pray as a Christian, God is there and he hears. God is inside you. Uh, and even though you might pray something stupid that you shouldn't have, uh, which we do all the time, we know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself himself maketh intercession for us, right? Uh, I'm misquoting a little bit, but it says, uh, with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, we send up a prayer like, God, I'm t I, I, I need some money. I, I can't pay this bill. Please send me some money in the mail. You know, and the Holy Spirit might hear that and go, he doesn't know what he's praying for, Lord, but here's what he needs, you know? So don't ever be afraid to pray to God. You ought to, in everything you think, you ought to pray without ceasing. And even if you feel like, I, I don't know if I'm praying for the right thing, you're probably not. <laughs> but praying is what you're supposed to do. And the Holy Spirit is being an intercessor for you and taking that, that prayer of yours that might have some errors, it might be wrong, but he's taking that prayer and he's cleaning it up and he's changing it into what it should be and delivering it to the Lord Amen. in a language that you can't even understand. Moanings, which, groanings, which cannot be uttered. Thank the Lord for that. Hey. What does that tell you? It doesn't matter the way you pray. It doesn't matter what words exactly you say, but it matters that you pray. And when you pray, there's only one witness, and that's God. God is my witness. And he's claiming that to prove, I pray for y'all. God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Before I move on, I wanted to point out Proverbs 15, 3 is a famous verse. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. That includes in your heart and in your mind, in your prayer closet in the car when you pray, wherever it is you pray, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Computers are a blessing and they are good. 2 Timothy 4, 16, the Bible says, this is Paul. He says, at my first answer, so when Paul first started to serve the Lord, when he first started to do right, at my first answer... No man stood with me. So there's Paul. How many people did he have on his right and his left hand ready to help him? No, no. At my first answer, no man stood with me. Listen. Uh, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. The Lord stood with me. That's an encouragement right there. That when you pray, you're not alone, God is a witness. When you take a stand, you're not alone, God is witness, and he is standing with you if you're standing on the truth. Uh, thank you. Proverbs 15, 3. My computer just put it out. So, we're going to have to continue on. I got it. Um, he says, God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. John chapter 4 and verse 24. Serving God with your spirit is the only way to serve him. You know, uh, you probably know this verse. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that spirit is a lowercase s in John 4, 24. And in Romans 1 chapter 9 here, he says, whom I serve with my spirit. That's a lowercase s. The thing inside you, the spirit, uh, Job chapter 32 and verse 8 says, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. You have a spirit inside you, and that spirit can affect you. And we've talked about the spirit that you have inside you. We've talked about the spirits that are outside that can affect you. And this spirit inside you, you should be serving the Lord with your spirit. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't totally understand what the spirit is inside of a man. I don't know exactly how it works. I can't see it. 
I can't smell it. I can't taste it. I can't touch it. I'm not exactly sure what the spirit in a man is like, but I know a couple things that it does because of the Bible. And based on this verse in Romans 1, 9, I know that you can serve the Lord with your spirit. And I know that when you see a man doing anything, you can tell, and this is still a, a common saying in the South, is he's doing it with his spirit or he's not doing it with his spirit. You know, if there's a man, uh, take anything, stacking up chairs, here's your average Joe. You know, you know, you know they're just kind of half ha haphazard, not really trying their best. There's no fervor. There's no zeal. That's your average, you know, Walmart employee who you see is lazy, who you know is going to get fired in a week. Your average fast food employee, forget that. Your average CEO of a company these days, your average anybody, people are lazy these days. They don't do things with their spirit. And uh, this goes back. It's not about how fast you go. It's about whether or not your spirit is in the thing. You know, somebody who's really stacking chairs the right way, you want to make sure it's lined up just right and you're trying to do it quick, but you're not too much in a hurry so that you're making mistakes and you're moving fast and you're doing the thing with your spirit. You can tell that guy is really, I mean, he is working hard. You see it every now and then, you know, maybe once every six months you see somebody who's actually willing to do some hard work. Here's an example. Tim May came to our church, what, like 8, 10, 12 months ago? He'd been with us a couple times. We hardly knew a thing about him. I wanted to get to know him because I saw he had a worn out Bible and I like guys who have a worn out Bible. Didn't talk much, but I can tell you this, he came to Grow in Grace one night and he beat us all here by probably 30 minutes and he was already in a full sweat raking leaves off of our driveway. And he didn't want a penny from us and he didn't want a bit of thanks from us. He was doing that with his spirit. He, was, he had his whole heart and attitude was in that thing and you could tell because he didn't have to break a sweat. He was soaking wet. <laughs> he had worked so hard. His spirit was in that thing. So here's a question. When you do anything, uh, whatsoever hand, thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Everything you do should be done with your full spirit. Your attitude, your heart, everything should be fully involved and committed to the thing that you're doing. You should never look lazy or sloppy. You should never be slovenly. The Bible says, not slothful in business, Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord in Romans 12. And there's nothing in your life more important than serving the Lord. And when you're serving the Lord, you better be doing it with your spirit. Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. There are other things that could be said about that, but I'll leave it there. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That, without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Uh, Paul is the one we are supposed to follow. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. He says, be thou followers of me. He says, those things which you have heard and received and seen in me, do. Paul wants us to do the things he did. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, uh, if any man among you be a prophet, think himself a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So Paul Speaking on behalf of the Lord, the command of the Lord is you need to behave the way Paul behaved if he was doing right. You need to follow Paul as he followed Christ. And one of the things that Paul did when he prayed was that he prayed for Christians. He said that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. So when Paul prayed, he would not cease to make mention for Rome, the church at Rome. So when you pray, here's what you ought to do. Lord, I pray that you'll be with the church at, I pray that you'll be with that church. I pray that you'll be with those folks. I pray that you'll be with these folks. I pray that you'll be with our folks. I pray you'll be with, pray individually for the people in your church. Pray for their needs. Pray spiritually for them. And if you say, what do I pray? I'm not sure what to pray. Well, first, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. We just talked about it. Second, if you want to pray a little more biblically, don't pray so much for the carnal things, which, you know, it's okay to pray for carnal things. That's fine. God wants to hear it. Paul spent most of his time praying for spiritual things, and the prayers that he prayed for the saints in his epistles were prayers like this. Pray, God, that your spirit would be enlightened, uh, that your eyes would be opened, that he would give you the spirit of understanding. He prayed that the Christians would, that the word of the Lord would be glorified. He gave thanks for churches and their obedience to Christ. He prayed to God that the church would uh, have their eyes opened and be given understanding in the word of God, revelation in the word of God, that they would understand the love of Christ that they would 
in this passage that we're about to read right here, he was praying that he could go visit them so that he could spiritually help them. Let's pray for spiritual things. We spend a lot of time praying for carnal things, but pray also, don't neglect to pray for spiritual things. And when you pray, don't just pray for yourself. You ought to pray for yourself, I believe. Uh, it's, I think it's totally fine to ask the Lord for help. Read the book of Psalms. David, David did it all the time. But also pray for others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Amen. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. One problem, real big problem that I have to fight, uh, a weight, I might even call it a sin that's in my flesh that I have to fight is selfishness. And, uh, you know, obviously we all do, but I'm telling you, I've got a special case of it. Uh, and the devil's, or, or my flesh is designed with the desire to only take care of myself and if it were not for the word of god i'd live on an island alone i never would have married karen back when i was eight, 18 i would have not i would have just found a way to be alone in the woods the rest of my life and i would have been happy doing it you know that's my flesh is i want to be alone and take care of myself and only do things that please me and something that the lord had to teach me through his word when i grew up spiritually was stop thinking about yourself all the time Amen. Think about others. And uh, you shouldn't show up to church and go, oh, oh, what's what's his name? Uh, he sits, uh, uh, oh, it's Jimmy. It should be pretty fresh on your mind because about 10 minutes ago, you should have been praying to the Lord, thinking about Jimmy and, and thinking about his needs and, and what the Lord wants for him and the things that he asked prayer for. You should be thinking about the others in the church. If it's in your heart and in your mind, nah, I don't need to say that. Pray without ceasing. We know that that's in the Bible. We know that right here, Paul gives us an example that without ceasing, he makes mention of the saints always in his prayers. So pray for others. It's very, very important. Any questions at all about Romans chapter 1, verses 7 through 9? Anything we read about? Okay, let's take a quick break and we'll dig into it.